Executive Director of the Dalberg Group. When we think about the, econ the, the opportunities for gig work in the economy, and here I'll speak about primarily the Kenyan economy, um, I think we can think about it as broadly fitting in three categories. The first, which is the first one everyone thinks about when they, when they think about gig economy, is some of the digital uh, or online work that, uh, on, on digital platforms, which is mostly uh, more or less for export, right? So the kind of work you find on a range of global platforms, which you can pick up, execute at home, submit online. In that space, uh, we are a growing provider and we have some advantages, but it is a highly competitive space and we face some challenges as we try to compete for share. Next to it is building those same kinds of demands here, right? In terms of whether government or formal corporations, as they begin to digitize or as they begin to create a space within their workforce for more short-term or gig-like activity. The good news about that is that doing more of that work allows us to be competitive even when doing international uh, or globally competitive work. The bad news is Kenya's formal sector is very, very small. Uh, and so the scope for it in the short run is not that big, but what exists we should take advantage of and should run with. The most exciting space though is using uh, the tools of the gig economy, particularly the ability of digital tools to connect supply to demand and provide information to both buyers and sellers, to take the 83% of Kenya's workforce that works in the informal sector and allow them to better find opportunities and better transact with each other. And so when you think about platforms like Link and others of that nature, what they're doing is they're reaching out to plumbers, uh, artisans, carpenters, etc., uh, to connect them to work. That's beginning to happen and to build momentum in urban areas. I mean, Uber is another example and there's many others where we're not yet seeing the same level of traction where I think there's huge opportunity is in rural Kenya. Where if you think about secondary cities and also just the pure rural areas, there's a lot of opportunity to connect particularly young people with specific types of work that are needed in the community. If we can get everyone onto the, the right kind of tools and transacting in the right way using platforms that are appropriate to where they're working and operating. When we think about the biggest barriers to the gig economy, uh, we need to separate them out, right? The first, the first set of barriers are barriers of the market itself, right? Particularly when you're thinking about competing in the global gig economy, uh, you're dealing with a highly competitive marketplace in which there are countries that have large scale and huge channels to market, such as India and the Philippines, uh, and indeed even some of the more developed economies where the workforce is becoming increasingly turned on to the gig economy, so it's highly competitive. They have lower costs of delivery in terms of their access to connectivity and so on and so forth. And then there's a huge range of skills which we need to build up, which are not just about formal skills that are learned in the, in, in, in the school environment, but a range of both soft skills around, uh, around work habits and so on and so forth, but then also skills that can only be learned through experience, through climbing the hierarchy of being a junior developer, a senior developer, or a writer, then an editor. And those are the kinds of things that we need to figure out how we are going to equip our youth with if they are to be competitive. So affordable infrastructure, a path to build the skills they need, both in formal education and beyond, and then a package that allows them to be competitive in highly competitive global markets or to build those markets domestically.